Always good to be back among the saints, and uh, I want to continue in the theme of ancient Israel and the church to talk about this idea, the kingdom of priests that uh, originated in ancient Israel and is carried out in the Israel of God today, that is the church. We are a kingdom of priests, and priests' business is teaching and offering. Priests are in the business of, of teaching and making offerings. Christians are, therefore, in the business of teaching and of making offerings. So we, as a kingdom of priests, are to be making sacrifices in our own lives for God and to be teaching others in our own lives for God. These are the things that constitute the work of a priest, and uh, we are looking at the sacrifices today. Uh, come back to the teaching, I hope. But as we mentioned, Exodus 19 is the place where the law of Moses starts. If you'll turn there, you, that's where we're going to read for a bit. But um, this is the place where the law of Moses started. They've just come out of Egypt, saved by God from slavery, they are in the wilderness at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God is about to reveal his law to them through his servant Moses. This will be established. And it is also the foundation of the principle that God's people are an entire nation of priests. He says here in Exodus 19 to Moses, to tell the people these things at verse 4 through 6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you'll be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So especially there at verse 6, we see you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation that God considers the entire kingdom to be made out of priests. And this is different from most kingdoms, if you will, where you know some certain class are the priests and the majority of the people are not. Here he says, you're a kingdom of priests and you're an entire nation that is holy, not just a holy district or a holy class, the religious class, but the whole nation is. And... So all of them are priests and all of them are holy. Well, how are they all priests under Moses? Well, they're not all priests under Moses. Under Moses, only the Levites are priests. How are they all priests? Well, it's what he said earlier in the fifth verse. You'll be my treasured possession among all the peoples, all peoples, all nations, that means for all the earth is mine. Every nation on earth belongs to him. Why would all the citizens of this one nation, Israel, be priests? Why would the entirety of this nation be the holy class if it isn't so that they can be the priests for all the other nations? Isn't it so that they can teach all peoples? For all the earth belongs to God? Yes, that's what it's for. That was always God's intention with Israel. They were to be the conduit, the means by which you and I learn about God and learn from God and receive the scriptures, the holy writings from God. Well, in the New Testament, uh, First Peter, I'd like to begin to understand what they have to say about it there in retrospect of Exodus 19, because the fact is that ancient Israel at Mount Sinai is a foreshadow, is a, a foretelling, you know, uh, a type 
of the kingdom of heaven, which is the church. So this is the idea for understanding the comparison. It was first drawn by Peter in 1 Peter in the second chapter. He's the first one, and 1 Peter is one of the first letters of the New Testament. This is written immediately after the church is scattered from Jerusalem in Acts 8 and verse 1. He's the first, if you will, to teach that Exodus 19 was a foretelling of the church today. So what he says is, as you come to him, that is to Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So first, we come to Christ, and as we are coming to him, we are being added, we are being built up into this priesthood. When you come to Christ, you enter the priesthood. And this priesthood does something specific. It is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ at verse 5. When you come to Christ, you enter the priesthood, you become a priest. And when you are living in Christ, having come to him, you serve in that capacity. And we have here in that fifth verse, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God and they're acceptable by means of Jesus. There is such a thing then as Christian sacrifices. They're not just limited to the law of Moses. Sacrifices are very much a part of the religion of Christ. But as it says here, they are spiritual sacrifices. And they are sacrifices made through Jesus Christ. When you keep looking at Peter, down in the ninth verse of the second chapter here, he said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Well, that is exactly what we just read in Exodus 19.6, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The next thing he says in the ninth verse is, a people for God's own possession. which is what God had said in Exodus 19, verse 5, my treasured possession among all peoples. So we see, you see this, I hope, plainly, Peter intended to draw the comparison to Exodus 19. That's the meaning here. It's very clear. We didn't make this up. It comes from the apostles. It comes from one of the first things that the apostles wrote. The church is the people of God in the Spirit. The church is the meaning behind this original pattern. And yes, if you look at the end of this book, you know, here in 1 Peter, we're at the start, but at the revelation of John, which is very late, very likely the last book to be written, John says in his fifth chapter, as he describes the saints singing in, in uh, the praises of God and the praises of the Lord Jesus, it says there in Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, they sang a new song, saying this, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood the ransom, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Again, we have the kingdom and priests, very clear. Clear reference, first of all, to 1 Peter, but also ultimately to Exodus 19, to this idea that this is the nation of God, the nation of God's people, and they are serving in this capacity as priests. But I picked this verse because of, uh, or I'm sorry, I picked this passage because of verse 10, Revelation 5.10, which says, and they shall reign on the earth. The usefulness of this is it's telling us we are priests here. We are priests today. You are serving today, here and now, 
on the earth. This is definitely the church. I realize that your songbook wants a new song to be sung in heaven, but that's just not reasonable. What it says is, they reign on the earth. We are singing the praises of God. It's a new song versus the song of Moses and the children of Israel on the other side of the Red Sea from, with their liberation from a foreign power. We have a new song. We're liberated from our sins. And we are reigning today. We are offering today on earth. Okay, so, on, as the Brits say. Romans chapter 12 is the next place to go because, well, this is what it's really about, isn't it? This is where we, we really want to gain the understanding, and I don't have some, you know, great mystery to unfold or some deep insight here. It's just laying these things out, but it's really what we've got to take home and understand. There are such things as Christian sacrifices, and they are spiritual in nature, and the question becomes, what then are these sacrifices? Does the New Testament tell us what these sacrifices are? They're not the goats and the lambs, you know, the pigeons and turtle doves of the Old Testament, the grain. Now, what Peter said, remember, 1 Peter 2, was spiritual sacrifices. And one of the places where the New Testament describes sacrifice is Romans 12, in verses 1 and 2, where Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The first sacrifice that is presented is our bodies, you know, our very own selves. But a living sacrifice, this is not death that we're talking about, you know, offering yourself up to be martyred or to be put to death. That's not what he's talking about here. This is not death. This is life in the Lord, that you give yourself to serve him, your body, your strength, your time however you want to think of that. This is to be presented to God, a living sacrifice. Your body should be holy and acceptable to God, and it's governed by spiritual worship, right? The mind is guiding this, how we decide what is what to do and how to offer this, how to live. And he goes on, do not be conformed to this world, verse 2, but be transformed by the renewal of, of your mind. So as part of this offering, we sacrifice not just the body, but also the mind, that we bring ourselves in obedience to him. Might have been something, you know, you might have thought of that in verse one. You might have thought, oh, offering the body means bringing ourselves in obedience to him. But where you really see that come to bear here is in the second verse. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. And how's that happening? It's happening by renewal of the mind. Obedience, yes, is in the body. That's true. But the body is the evidence of what's happening in, in the mind. What's, that's why it's a spiritual service or worship, a reasonable worship, some of them say, or service. It's the mind that's being renewed if we are going to be transformed into what God wants us to be. So we're sacrificing the body. Yes, but we're sacrificing the mind, giving ourselves to God in thought and in deed, right? Our mind is on him and on his things. Our goals are his. Our purposes are his. And Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 11, I think are a very clear parallel or commentary, however you want to say it. They're clearly getting at the same ideas and themes as we have here in Romans 12. Because he says, there, at one time you were darkness, now you're light in the Lord, walk as children of light. 
Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, ex- expose those things. It's very much the same, that we're not conformed to this world. We don't go along to get along. We are transformed by God, by renewal of the mind, but this again is governed by the Spirit, the spiritual worship of verse 1. That's coming through the Word. And he finally says there in the second verse, we do these things that by testing we may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. We sacrifice, what does that mean? It means that we sacrifice our comfort. Our comfort, yes. Why comfort? Because testing is hard. Testing means you don't just believe somebody. Right? First John 4, 1 and 2, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. You don't just believe everybody who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah, I believe. No. You can't just take that at face value. Oh, he's a good preacher. Okay. Maybe he is. I hope that he is. But listen. Find out. Discernment has to be there. It's got to be educated. That takes work as well. So yes, that's uncomfortable. See, people don't want to ask questions. They don't want to deal with problems that mean they might have to question where, you know, what they've accepted or whom they've accepted. You know, they're, if some question comes up about the preacher where they attend or the elders where they attend, they just don't even want to hear it. They don't even want to consider the possibility that that might be true. Or the preacher where one of their family members or relatives attends, yet they don't want to hear anything about that because that would mean they're going to have to discern what is true here. Is this person doing right or doing wrong? And the consequences of that, if this preacher is doing wrong, then why is he allowed to be here? And what do we do about that? And why hasn't that been done? And what does that mean? If he's not faithful and the elders know that he's not faithful and this is what they want, or the, the brethren know that he's not faithful by and large, and that's what they want, what does that say about that church? And what does that mean for me? Well, it means I'm going to have to do something. You're going to have to teach. You're going to have to try to reach, but you may have to leave. People don't like that. And what does it mean if the preacher where my uncle goes is not faithful And my uncle is fine with that. It means my uncle's not faithful is what it means. Whether he's my uncle or not is irrelevant. But see, people don't want that. They're too busy doing the will of self, not the will of God. That's why it's a sacrifice. Sacrifice is hurt. But our job is to face God to desire the will of God, to desire what is good, acceptable, perfect for God. It has to be something you're willing to offer. We're not even going to Malachi 1, but you may recall that if you are a student of the Bible, of all the things that they offered that were not good or acceptable or perfect. But Hebrews 5 describes this idea of testing and discernment when he says, In Hebrews 5.14, the mature, spiritually mature, have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. When things are gray, when you don't know and you, you can't figure out, that is not a sign of strength and objectivity. That is a sign of immaturity. You should know the difference between right and wrong. If you are a priest of God, it is your job to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. you got to do this. Is that comfortable? No, it's not comfortable, but that's the truth. That's what the Bible says. This is the calling from the apostle that God sent. Over in Philippians, another letter from Paul. In the second chapter, you find this 
idea. Which admittedly we're breaking into, we're, we're grabbing this thought kind of midstream, picking it out of what he's saying, but stick with me on it, it's true. He said to the church at Philippi, in, you know, as he is writing from prison, and he knows that Rome is hanging, you know, an axe above his head, that he may well be executed by Rome. He says to the church at Philippi, even if, and this is Philippians 2, 17, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of all your, of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. And likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. He writes to them saying he wants to be with them again. He hopes that God will let them do so. He thinks that it's probably for the best that he continued to work for us. But, you know, that may not be what happens. He may be poured out a drink offering on the sacrifice, the sacrifice of their faith. That is to say, his life may be lost in this process of building up the faith of the church at Philippi. And, of course, building up the faith of the church of Philippi includes the writing of this letter that you and I have, which means it's the building up of our faith right? Paul's life was poured out as an offering so that we would have the truth. He sacrificed of himself for the good of others. And 2 Timothy 4, 6 says just as much when he at the end of his life tells Timothy, I'm already being poured out a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. He knew then he was going to be executed. Oh, it's clear. He was willing, though, as he said, to give his life, the 18th verse of Philippians 2 says. Or, yeah, I'm sorry, even the 17th. He said, even if it's true, I'm glad and rejoice with you, and you should be glad and rejoice with me. Be why would that be? Well, because we know that he uh, discharged his duty as a priest and that his hope is a blessed one and his estate with God is a blessed one. There is a reason, you know. There is a hope for something better than this. There's heaven. And later in Philippians, in, in uh, the fourth chapter, we pick this one out of the stream as well, but it says what it says. The church at Philippi actually sent money to Paul and they were the only church that sent money to Paul when he was taking this trip along the coast of the Aegean Sea into the Greek, into the Greek city-states. And they sent him money, not just when they were right up there next to him in Thessalonica, right next to Philippi, but all the way through down through uh, uh, Athens and Corinth, and they're taking care of this guy. And he said to them in the 18th verse of the fourth chapter here, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. We sacrifice our money for God. That money came from the treasury of the church at Philippi. And that treasury is built by the contributions of the members. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, right? Acts 4, it's laid at the, uh, at the apostles' feet. And the apostles governed it in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. But here the apostle makes clear the church from its treasury, the church of Philippi, sent money to Paul to support him in preaching. It's a full payment. And this money that was sent to support preaching is a gift a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, but not made to Paul. Although he is the recipient of that and he needs that because, well, he needs to live, he needs to eat. 1 Corinthians 9, do we have no right to eat? But it's an offering, it's a sacrifice to God. The money is God's. When we give of our means. We're giving to God. 
You know, people, I've heard, you know, well-intended, I understand, but I heard a brother say that the, the treasury is, is being, is made of the brethren's hard-earned money. Um, and it's good to think about respect for what brethren are doing, but that's not correct at all. The treasury is made of God's money. Whether you earned it hard or not is not the point. The point is you gave it to God. It now belongs to God, not you, not me. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's God's. And his will should be done with it. That's what's commanded in Scripture. So we're sacrificing our money. We're giving up control of it on the service of God. That's what's good and what's acceptable and what's perfect, right? And over in Hebrews 13, there's another couple of things here. And then we're out. Yes, there's a string of admonitions there at the end of Hebrews. And the 15th verse is one of the pearls on that string. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. What else are we sacrificing? We're sacrificing our own name. The sacrifice of Hebrews 13, 15 is the praise of God, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Our praise is not of ourselves or of one another, but of God. Our lips acknowledge not ourselves or one another, but his name. We have humility and a proper respect for God and his word and what God has enabled us to do through his son Jesus by his grace. So yes, I sacrifice my own name. I'm, I don't have to be somebody. Jesus is the one who is somebody. God is the one who has a name. And in the 16th verse of this same chapter, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The sacrifices of Hebrews 13, 16 are to do good and to share what you have. So we're to be ready to sacrifice our possessions, the things that we own. We we continue the same thought that was with the... uh, The church who first obeyed, as recorded in Acts 4, none of them considered the things they owned to be their own. Which is not to say they were the first communist government in history. That's kind of ridiculous. It's talking about their heart was such that they were like Hebrews 13, 6. They were ready to share with everybody else who was around them, whoever had need. And this kind of a sacrifice is the kind of thing that is pleasing to God. We are ready to share with a fellow person who is here with us on earth. As we read in Revelation that we are reigning on earth, we are serving as priests on earth. And in Exodus 19, 5, remember what God said there, all the earth is mine. All the earth is mine is not him establishing ownership of everything and, you know, making a statement of how great he is. Though he does have those things, that's not what he means. In its context, he's clearly saying, you are the special people, you are the priests, because all of the nations belong to me. In other words, We are here to help everybody else. They're supposed to come to God through us. We're supposed to help them. And doing good and sharing is part of it. All those individual sacrifices are things that the New Testament calls sacrifices, and you see why they are sacrificial. And you see, the heart of all of those things is a selflessness, a humility, a respect for God, but also a concern for the neighbor. You might say that the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all the heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself as the second, as somebody said. Well, are you 
A Christian, are you a child of God? It's time to think about this. Have you, as a Christian, have you been obeying the things that you know and have read? As we speak of God's invitation for you to obey the gospel, we speak of Jesus as the high priest. And not to get too technical on this, but a little bit. First, in Revelation 1, you have verses 5 and 6 that Jesus Christ is the, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, he is the one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, yes, but he is the one, verse 6, who made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. This Jesus Christ is the one. He loves us. He freed us from our sins. He gave himself. That's his blood. He made it happen. He's the one who caused it to be the case that we now are a kingdom of priests. And in the fifth chapter, again, in that ninth and tenth verses, we look now at a part that we didn't see earlier or didn't emphasize earlier. And in the ninth verse, why is Jesus worthy? He is worthy because... You were slain, Jesus, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. This Jesus is the one who made, it, made us into a kingdom of priests. This Jesus is the one whose offering of himself is worthy it's worthy he, because he is the offering and it's a worthy offering for him to open all things to us because he therefore is the high priest. He is the forerunner into the holiest of holies for us. He ransomed every nation with his blood. He was slain and yet he lives. He's resurrected and his blood is the price paid for every nation, not just Israel, ancient Israel. This is how he made us into a kingdom of priests. And it goes all the way back to where we started, 1 Peter chapter 2. What we're saying is that Jesus did this for you and for me, that we should be saved, that we should be Christians. And the power of what he is doing comes from the God who made him into the high priest, from the God who made him the offering for sin. And as it said there in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, we, as we're being built up a holy priesthood, are offering spiritual sacrifices. But we notice now in 2, oh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2, Verse 5, that these are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our sacrificial offerings coming through Jesus Christ is telling us something specific. Christ means anointed, the Lord's anointed. Who is the Lord's anointed? It's his king. We are offering sacrifices. Those sacrifices are going up through another one, Jesus. He's the high priest through whom our sacrifices are channeled. But he's not just the high priest. He's also the Lord's anointed. He is both priest and king. And this is where, you know, Hebrews 7 verses 1 through 3, talk to us about the one who was priest and king, Melchizedek, because it's telling us that Jesus is the one who fulfilled that figure. He has 
a timeless life, a power to bless the entire uh, ancestry or, or descendancy, the entire nation of the descendants of Abraham. We can offer to God and we can be accepted by God only by means of this king and priest, Jesus. He's the king, he's the high priest, and he's the means by which we approach God acceptably. So would you approach God today is the question. Today, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? It's always been the case that God intended for us to come out of the world the way that Israel came out of Egypt and to come into a relationship, an agreement with him to serve him from then on and to serve him acceptably, but also to help our neighbors. If you're not a Christian, why not? Why not serve him? Why not become his child today? We serve him accept acceptably in Christ Jesus, and we are told in Acts 2.38 that the way to get into Christ Jesus is to repent and to be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We here have water that you might be baptized in his name, that you might become a Christian, and you coming to him will be built into a spiritual dwelling, a priesthood. You will begin to live your life from now on for God. If you are a Christian and have not lived right, repent, of course, and come back to God and remember and center again on what it is that we are doing. We are not living for ourselves. We are working for God, and we have a blessed estate awaiting us. Why not join Paul in saying, even if it happened that way, I'm glad, and you should be glad for me. That attitude doesn't come from a desire to die or a death wish. That attitude comes from the knowledge that he is here working for God and that God's promises are sure and far greater than whatever we pay for them when we make sacrifices. Christian friend, if you haven't lived right, repent. Come back to God. If we can pray with you, we will. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.